I'm the Dapper Dino, and today I'd like to talk about kinds. Because the effects of evolution are obvious in some organisms, even within the span of a human life, creationists have been forced to accept that microevolution, which they call change within kinds, does indeed occur. They claim that natural selection and mutation can cause creatures to vary, but never allow one kind to become another. Of course, this raises the obvious question of what a kind is, and what it would look like, if one kind did indeed become another kind. Unfortunately, creationists never give a very rigorous definition of kind, despite having a whole pseudoscience devoted to it. That is, baraminology, from the Hebrew bara, meaning he created, and min, meaning from. This field attempts to determine which living organisms constitute a created kind, and is similar to phylogenetics, in that both seek to determine ancestry for various extant and extinct creatures. However, it holds as a foundational assumption that at some point the common ancestry evident in life must stop, and so no matter what the evidence, humans, for example, may not be concluded to be related to non-human apes. Perhaps the most trivial and useless definition of a kind is that given by Ray Comfort, who tends to say that a kind is obvious by just looking. Dogs are a kind, he says. How do we define kinds, though? I mean, it, it, it seems like a really vague term. Well, it's very, very clear. We've got the canine kind. Coyote, and the domestic dog, you've got the feline kind, the cat, and the uh, tiger, and you've got human kind. It's very, very clear. Okay, so dogs, wolves, and probably coyotes are in the dog kind. But what about the golden jackal? What about the dole? What about the African painted dog? What about the maned wolf of South America? What about the red fox? In each of these cases, the animal in question is less and less like a wolf or dog and none of them can breed with wolves, dogs, or coyotes. But even further, what about the extinct borophagines? They are less dog-like than even a fox, but they are clearly more like the previously mentioned canids than they are like anything else. Do they belong in a dog kind? While looking at just the more commonly known examples of dog-like creatures, it might be easy to think that dogs and wolves are part of the dog kind, and there you have it. But when looking at the full diversity of canines and near canines in the modern world and fossil record, suddenly it's not so clear that it's obvious what's in the dog kind. Kent Hovind has a proposed solution. If the creatures can bring forth, that is, reproduce together, then they should be counted as the same kind. What is a kind? Okay, Aaron, you interrupted me 288 times, so I'll try to explain it one more time. This is stuff I showed you that night, and I'll show Ross now. There are two kinds, two varieties, I, I use the word kind kind of loosely here, there are two varieties of squirrels that live on opposite sides of the Grand Canyon, Kaibab squirrel and the Abert squirrel. They probably had a common ancestor. There are 200 varieties of squirrels, 200 species. It's called the squirrel kind. Okay, you're five. Would you say this animal and this animal and this animal are the same kind of animal? Yes, no. No. No? Why are they different? Is this the same as a pine tree? No. I would say the brown one and the white one look the same. And the... They're all a squirrel. They're the same kind. See, the Bible says they bring forth after their kind. There are 350 breeds of horses. They probably had a common ancestor. Miniature horses, we showed you these slides the other night uh, in my program. One of the world's smallest horses. we got to get one of those here. A miniature horse. Anna, can you check on that? There's a place in Mobile that raises them. So, these are called the horse kind, Ross and R, and I'm trying to help you now. These are the same kind of animal. They're not a squirrel, they're not a pine tree, they're not a whale, okay? Since he includes hybrids such as mules as evidence that modern equids are a single kind, we can safely conclude that any offspring, whether fertile or not, that are produced by the mating of two creatures would constitute evidence that the creatures are in the same kind. There are two obvious problems with this, though. The first is that we have seen reproductive incompatibility arise real-time through evolution. The second is that not all creatures reproduce sexually. Virtually all single-celled organisms use asexual reproduction as their normal means of reproduction. But there are also parthenogenic arthropods and even vertebrates, that is, animals that are all female and do not mate but reproduce anyway. It's not clear how a bring-forth definition for kind would apply in these cases. Ken Ham usually gives a definition like that of Kent Hovind, emphasizing reproduction as the key feature of kind. Interestingly, he is also known for showing off what he calls the creationist orchard, 
in which modern diversity is traced back to ancestral forms which themselves share no common ancestry. Take dogs, okay? In a scientific paper dated January 2014, that's this year, <laughs> scientists working at the University of California stated this. We provide several lines of evidence supporting a single origin for dogs and disfavoring alternative models in which dog lineages arise separately from geographically distinct wolf populations. And they put this diagram in the paper. By the way, that diagram is very, very similar to this diagram that creationists propose based upon the creation account in Genesis. Uh, we're not saying God created all those species. We're saying create, God created kinds. And we're not saying species got on the ark, we're saying kinds. In fact, we've had researchers working on what is a kind. For instance, there's a number of papers published on our website where, for instance, they look at dogs and they say, well, this one breeds with this one, with this one, with this one, this, this one, this one. And you can look at all the papers around the world and you can connect them all together and say that obviously represents one kind. In fact, as they've been doing that research, they have predicted probably less than actually a thousand kinds uh, were on Noah's ark. If you look at any one of the diagrams of the creationist orchard, what you will see is what scientists would call a phylogenetic tree. That is, each node where there is a split into two lines represents a common ancestor between the descendant lines, all eventually converging to the common ancestor of the whole group. That Ham's diagrams usually include an extinction event corresponding to the flood of Noah, with only one line continuing past, is not of any consequence. His creationist orchard is still a collection of phylogenies. In this, Ken Ham may have inadvertently stumbled into a viable definition of kind. Assuming we take his orchard seriously as an admission that modern organisms share common ancestry, and that organisms that share a common ancestor all constitute a kind, the only real distinction between a clade and a kind, then, is that a kind is a clade that is not related through ancestry to any other kind, whereas clades can be nested inside both kinds and other clades, as shown on Ham's diagrams. So what does modern evolutionary biology say about kinds, then? Well, it says that essentially there is only one kind, life. Or at least that all life on Earth constitutes a single kind. To go back to canines, we see that they are all part of a clade. But since Borophagians aren't really canines, but clearly form a clade with the true canines, neither is a kind. But then we can simply go back farther and note that they form a natural group with animals such as bears, seals, wolverines, and raccoons. So we have the clade caniforms. But caniforms form a natural group with the cat-like creatures, including cats. That is the order Carnivora. Similarly, Carnivora forms a natural group with the pangolins, called ferae. And the ferae form a natural group with the ungulates, called ferungulata. I could go on for scores more such groupings, but I think you get the idea. The only rigorous definition of kind we can glean from creationists requires that we cut off the work of cladistics arbitrarily in order to preserve the notion that various modern forms did not evolve from more primitive forms in the past. But there is no objective reason to do so. Any place a creationist puts a cutoff and declares that these creatures are in a kind, but the next closest things to them are in a different kind, is arbitrary. There is no reason to say that there is a mouse kind and a rat kind, but that they are not related to each other. But even more, there is no reason to say that all the rodents, including beavers and capybaras, do not share a common ancestor. So how do creationists counter this? Well, the most common response simply seems to be to ignore the problem. Another common one is to simply misunderstand how cladistics work. An argument you might hear from Kent Hoven, or the even crazier but far less charismatic G-Man, is that a dog will always produce a dog, and that if a dog, here I generously interpret a dog to mean a population of dogs, cannot produce a non-dog, again taken to be a population, then it also follows that non-dogs could never evolve into dogs. If dogs indeed constituted a kind, that is, they all shared a common ancestor with each other, but not anything else, then this would indeed be true. Nothing could evolve into a dog, nor could a dog evolve into anything that is not a dog. But why is this? Well, dogs, no matter how restrictive we'd like to be with the definition, form a clade, whether or not they form a kind. But any organisms that diverge from within a clade will always be members of that clade even if they go on to form new clades. So we could say, for the sake of argument, that the wolf-slash-dog kind includes the dole. Let's say in the future that the dole diversifies into two populations which look and act differently and do not or cannot interbreed. They will still be dole populations. And similarly, 
If the gray wolf splits into two populations that are similarly distinct, they will be wolves. And yet both would be in the wolf-slash-dog kind, or clade. As Aaron Ross says, you cannot outgrow your ancestry. You can see the same thing in human languages. English, German, French, and Portuguese are all Indo-European languages. But English and German are Germanic languages, while French and Portuguese are Romance languages. We even know very well what language the Romance languages share a common ancestor with. That is, Latin. Currently, the Portuguese spoken in Brazil and the Portuguese spoken in Portugal are diverging, and have done so to the point that speakers from those two countries have trouble understanding each other, and translations into Portuguese are generally not shared between those countries. Fairly soon, Portuguese will split into two languages, but both languages will still be Indo-European, and both will be Romance languages, and importantly, they'll both still be Portuguese, although we may start calling them by new names. So if wolves and doles share a common ancestor with, say, foxes, that ancestor was not a wolf, or a dole, or a fox. We would call it a canine, though, and all its descendants would be canines. Similarly, if all mammals share a common ancestor, we would say that that ancestral population would be mammals. But none of them would be dogs. However, as that population branched into different groups, some of them eventually would be dogs. And once a group became dogs, its descendants would always be dogs, even as they became something new on top of being dogs. This rule is called the Law of Monophyly. It is why, as Kent Hovind says, cows will always produce cows, dogs will always produce dogs, and corn will always produce corn. Unfortunately for him, he doesn't realize that this is exactly how descent with modification works, both in biological evolution and even with languages. There is one topic I would like to touch on here. It relates to phylogenetics, and specifically Kent Hovind. Kent is fond of saying that phylogenetic trees are simply lines drawn on paper, and then saying that they are based on certain characteristics cherry-picked to give conclusions compatible with evolution. He then says that if you made a cladistic tree from mass, or lifespan, or chromosome number, that you would get a different tree. And I'm holding in front of me, I'll show it from Encyclopedia Britannica 2005, a phylogenetic tree based on the nucleotide differences in the gene for cytochrome C. And they have all these creatures with lines drawn between them, showing that a human, a monkey, a dog, a horse, a pig, etc., and a, a moth, and a screw worm, and a tuna are all related to a common ancestor. They draw these lines on the paper, and that becomes their science. Now, I'm curious, why did they choose to use the phylogenetic tree based on cytochrome C? Why don't you make a tree based on the number of chromosomes, or based on the adult body weight, or based on life expectancy, or based on life or gestation period, or based on average number of offspring, or based on because the number of teeth? they have to focus on derived synapomorphies. A big problem is that all these things he has picked as examples that would generate different phylogenetic trees are things with a single dimension. Chromosome count, for example, is a single number. You can only put such an analysis on a line. On the other hand, he likes to point to a phylogeny based on a gene for cytochrome C. But a gene is not a single dimensional thing. Each base pair is a separate variable with its own possible range of values. And that is ignoring the possibility of gene duplication and indels, which can create further dimensions of variability. You need more than one trait to form a tree, preferably as many traits as you can, all of which can take at least two states. Further, the things Hoven has picked are known to vary significantly even among creatures Hoven would recognize as being in the same kind. For example, dogs are known to vary greatly in body weight and lifespan, while horses and donkeys have different numbers of chromosomes. It is not easy, therefore, to see why he thinks including these as significant characteristics for the basis of a phylogenetic analysis would be considered as reasonable as things like tooth count, genetic sequences, vertebrate counts, the presence or absence of unique bones, etc., things which often are used. Using such traits to draw cladistic trees is how we know, for example, that a Tyrannosaurus rex is closer to a Velociraptor than it is to me, despite me being in the middle of the two for size. There are numerous other anatomical conditions they share that I do not, hence they are in the clade Salurosauria, but not me. Well, that's all I have regarding creationist kinds and phylogeny. Thank you for watching, and please comment, like, and share. If you want to be updated when I post more videos, please subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell icon so YouTube knows to always give you notifications when I upload.